This is Office Hours at Duke University. Today, Dean Sam Wells is taking your questions. He'll be talking about leadership in difficult times. As head of Duke Chapel, Dean Wells seeks to preach, teach, speak, and write in such a way that brings faith to intellect and intellect to faith. Before coming to Duke in 2005, Wells served in a variety of settings as a priest in the Church of England. At Duke, he is Dean of the Chapel and also a research professor of Christian ethics at the Divinity School. He is author most recently of Speaking the Truth, Preaching in a Pluralistic Culture. This semester, he is teaching the course Ethics in an Unjust World, Making Decisions to Live Lives of Consequence. Everyone watching is invited to ask Dean Wells a question. To do that, post a comment on the Duke University Facebook page, tweet with the tag Duke Live, or email live at duke.edu. Dean Wells, we're here at your office hours to talk about leadership in difficult times. It's not too hard to find evidence of difficult times. There's high unemployment, two wars, disputes within the church, but what about leadership? Are there strong public examples for you of leadership? Well, leadership in difficult times, I think, is really about addressing the three feelings that are so difficult. And the first is denial, and the second is paralysis, and the third is fear. Uh, and so what a leader needs to do in a difficult patch is address those three profound feelings. And you address denial by saying, look, this is happening. This is serious. This is real. Uh, I, I realize how much this matters, and, 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 and of course, if there's been some culpability in bringing it about, I take full responsibility for what's, hap what's happened. Uh, so there has to be a, a level of transparency to start with and reality. Uh, and then to address the paralysis, you, you need to say, well, these are the things that we can do. Things are bad, but there are some things that we can do. And of course, that takes a consultation process because as a leader, you don't always know what those things are but somebody around you will know, and they'll give you some examples. Uh, and you need to say, and this is some of the things that we can do. But then true leadership takes you to a third stage where you say, and actually this is a moment when we fall back on our core values, when we fall back on the true identity of our institution or our cause or whatever it might be. Uh, and this is a moment of renewal where we discover something we didn't already know, we discover something uh, we weren't actually doing that perhaps is truer to who we are uh, than we would have discovered had there not been a crisis. I think of the movie The Queen. I don't know if anyone uh, engaging in this dialogue uh, saw the movie The Queen, which seems to me to be a story of how the Queen of England, after the death of Princess Diana, uh, went through those stages. Initially, she said, you know, nothing serious has happened. This person isn't even a member of the royal family anymore. We shouldn't be making such a fuss about this. She went through that denial phase. Uh, and then there was nothing I can usefully do to make things better until finally she was persuaded she had to stand in front of the people, at least on TV, uh, and, and, and just be present to them. There was something that she could do. Uh, and then uh, the film shows the story of how the royal family realized this was actually rather than a threat to the royal family, this was a time for renewal of their place and the affections of the, the British people and people more broadly. Uh, and I guess if, if we think of a, a contemporary example, I, I have to say at the time, I was a, a little bit baffled by President Obama's inauguration address because back in January, because uh, it was so downbeat. You know, I expected, you know, all the two million or so people who'd gathered in Washington, D.C. were expecting, I imagine, some, uh, you know, some amazing story of how a person from his background had come to be President of the United States and what the significance of that was in the story of the United States, that if you like, they were expecting him to jump straight to the third stage that I've referred to. But he spent a lot of serious time saying, we're in a real mess as a country, our economy is in a real mess, uh, and I'm taking that very, very seriously. I realize the feelings involved, I realize the personal consequences for many of the people of the United States, most of the people of the United States that this is causing. So he stayed with addressing the denial, he stray, uh, stayed with the seriousness of the situation. And then he moved on to saying, here are some practical things that we can actually do and my administration will do, as, as politicians always say. Uh, and, and then he, he spent a little bit of time on that third area. And, and actually, well, in some ways, I was a little bit disappointed because I, I was watching, because I hoped he would dwell on the third area. Uh, I actually admired him enormously for, for, uh, for staying with the first two stages of that. 
Now, Dean Wells, you just preached a sermon last Sunday on leadership, jumping off of Jesus' instruction that whoever wants to become great among, among you must be your servant. What is your take on Christian leadership? Well, I, I see in general terms, I talked a tiny bit just now about what, what leadership in a crisis involves. In, in, in general terms, I think of four uh, dimensions of leadership. Uh, first of all, you've got what I would call a spokesperson uh, who represents an organization uh, outside that organization who's able to find words to express the values of that organization and its purposes. Uh, and then you've got a chair who's the kind of grown-up in the organization who makes sure everybody gets paid and the right people get hired and the, uh, the, you know, the, the responsibilities are met and minutes are kept and, and, so, and so on. Uh, and then you've got the facilitator who's like the athletics coach who goes around getting the best out of every person in the team uh, and, and has a quiet word to say to each person and, 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 and works out uh, how, how, how everybody's skills can be harnessed. And then you've got the fourth person, which I, the fourth dimension, which I call the epitome, who's the, who's the person who stands for all that's best about the institution and, and epitomizes what the institution's really about. Uh, and what I was saying about Christian leadership is that when, when Jesus says that uh, uh, there are temptations involved in leadership, he's not saying that, that the chair and the spokesperson roles aren't important. Uh, but he's saying that that's where the temptations lie. That's the where the temptations lie to take perks for yourself, to gain benefit for yourself, uh, which doesn't accrue to the organization as a whole. And that's what attracts cynicism towards leaders, that they're actually only there for themselves and they're not really there because they're captains who would go down with the ship. They're not really there for the organization itself. And so the, the roles, it seems to me, that are more servant roles, i.e., where your identity is more wrapped up with the institution uh, are the roles of facilitator and epitome. So it's not saying that Christian leaders uh, shouldn't be chairs and shouldn't be spokespeople because we need, ne we need those roles. It's saying that that's, you know, be, be careful in those roles uh, and make sure whatever you are, that you are an epitome and you are a facilitator who sees your, your good as getting the best out of everybody else. Dean Wells, we have about 150 people participating here in your office hours, and everyone watching is invited to ask a question. To do that, post a comment on the Duke University Facebook page, tweet with the tag Duke Live, or email live at duke.edu. We've got a question that has come in by email from Valerie. Uh, speaking of her particular workplace circumstances, she says, I find that people are being promoted to positions because they possess one competency, i.e. technical ability, However, they lack relationship building, team building skills, or self-knowledge. What can institutions do to ensure that future leaders have the competencies necessary to be in leadership? Well, I, I think people are promoted with that one skill, but the, the, the people who have just the one skill probably don't stay in leadership all that long. I, I was very influenced by a, uh, a person in my previous congregation in Cambridge in England uh, who'd done some research with Rolls-Royce. He'd worked in Rolls-Royce all his life, and he'd done some research about who ends up getting the highest salaries in an organization like Rolls-Royce uh, 10 or more years after being hired by the company. And how can, you, how can you gauge that? And you couldn't gauge it by their hiring salary, and you couldn't gauge it by their educational qualifications. But in the end, having gone through a number of criteria, what he discovered was that the, the common feature was the people with the higher salaries were those who were able to articulate a vision and communicate it and inspire a team of people. So it seems to me that, that that's what unites, I guess, all the four roles that I was talking about earlier. Uh, and uh, I guess I would, uh, in response to Valerie's question, I, I would uh, highlight the fact that um, humility is a very significant feature. You can't embody all these skills yourself. There's no such thing as a perfect leader. And even if there is a perfect leader, nothing grows in the shade of a great tree. Uh, you can make life extremely difficult for your successors by trying to be too perfect. The point is to work out, uh, as in many aspects of life, where, the, where are the bits that you're good at and come easily to you, uh, and try to be as good as you can at those bits, and where are the bits that don't come so easily to you, and how uh, you can actually <laughs> encourage and invite uh, other people to cover some of those areas uh, for you. So uh, the role of the facilitator, though, I think is, is really key. It's, it's about team building. that. Uh, organizational life is a, is a team game and if one person assumes that all the ideas and all the credit uh, are all focused around them, the organization isn't going to be very successful for very long.
Dean Wells, you preached a sermon some years back that touched on leadership. It cast Queen Esther as a model for leadership. What is this Esther model of leadership? Well, uh, I guess it, it, it's a little bit like the third, the third crisis model that I, that I started off. Esther, the story of Esther in the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible is, uh, is a story of how the Jews, uh, the Jews were living in uh, Persia, in the city of Susa, uh, during the Persian Empire, around about um, 430 or so years before Christ. Uh, and they had a decree passed uh, against them to, to wipe out all the Jews in the Persian Empire. And of course, if, that, if this was a historical story, as was disputed, but if it was a historical story and if this had been carried out, there would, you know, all the Jews would have been wiped out because they all lived in the Persian Empire at the time. Uh, and it's the story of how Esther becomes queen, but she becomes queen by, by joining the harem of the king. Uh, and then she takes tremendous risks in order to save her people. But uh, it's really, I, 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 I preach the sermon about it because of this phrase in, in the book of Esther, for such a time as this, her cousin Mordecai says to her, maybe you have become uh, queen, you've risen to this high royal station for, for just such a time as this. Uh, and I guess we get moments in our lives, both uh, in the ups and downs of our own lives and in the lives of the institutions and the countries that we live in, where we we suddenly get a, a get a, a moment where we think, well, maybe you know this mess <laughs> that that I'm in, or this confusing set of circumstances uh, that I find myself in, maybe if I look back in my own personal history and work out all the unresolved things that I haven't known quite what to do with and that have happened to me and that I've been engaged with. Sometimes maybe I felt mistakes I've made or years of my life spe spent doing what seemed at the time to be do doing dead end jobs. Maybe all of those things have prepared me for just this moment. Uh, and when you get those experiences, I've had those experiences a couple of times in my life, uh, you can suddenly get this incredibly, incredible rush of adrenaline that says, actually, without this crisis and without those setbacks that have happened to me, I would never have been able to stand here at this moment. Maybe I really have been put here for just such a time as this. Dean Wells, we have about 175 people participating in this office hours session. Everyone is invited to jump into the conversation by Facebook, by Twitter, or by email. We've got an email question here from Fred who asks, why have churches been so silent about the two immoral and disastrous wars in Iraq and Afghanistan? Well, I guess uh, putting it bluntly in response to the question the way it's put, uh, it's partly because the churches haven't been able to work out whether the wars were disastrous or whether they were immoral, because those are two slightly different things. Uh, it, it, taking the disastrous line, you could say that we're in Afghanistan to find bin Laden. Remember him? That was the person we went in to find, as far as I recall. Uh, and we're in Iraq to find uh, weapons of mass destruction. Remember them? Uh, and you know, we found ourselves committed to these uh, endeavors. Many people spoke out against certainly the second of those endeavors uh, before it uh, came about. Um, and the temptation is to be that the wise uh, public policy one can say, oh, well, the, the, this is a disastrous war. But then on the other hand, you've got people who feel that war is immoral uh, full stop, or these wars might be particularly immoral for a, for a number of, of possible reasons. And I think it partly reflects the confusion of the churches about whether they're there to, to advise on public policy, uh, that's the disastrous side of the question, or whether they're to a, there to be a kind of moral conscience or a critical friend to the nation in terms of, of right and wrong. And, and I think the churches in America have often been very confused about which of those roles uh, they were best there uh, to provide. The people on the whole who I think think of the wars as immoral are inclined to be people uh, who, who tend to think of all war as being immoral, which I think is a, a very appropriate position for a Christian to hold. But of course, it, 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 uh, it doesn't make it more likely that those people are going to speak out at times of crisis. Um, but if you think the wars are disastrous, then that puts you into a, a, a kind of a public policy frame of mind that many people feel the churches don't have a particularly advantageous vantage point to, uh, to speak on. Uh, I, I, I feel I've heard lots of voices saying uh, that after 9-11, the key words were, were uh, truth-telling, uh, reconciliation and forgiveness, rather than 
uh, immediate war. It might have been better to have a longer period of reflection as a nation before, uh, before engaging in a war that was pr proved to be very, very difficult to win. Um, many people said that, although there was such high anxiety at the time, it was understandable how that was a difficult policy to pursue. Uh, and, and then secondly, in relation to Iraq, uh, well, I myself on record having preached about the subject in uh, October 2006 here at Duke Chapel, I think my views about the Iraq war are fairly widely known amongst anyone who's interested in my views. So uh, I think uh, those, those, those views haven't necessarily been as widely reported. I'm not talking about my own, but I'm talking about church leaders, uh, as might have been the case. I think many church leaders have spoken out. Rowan Williams, the Archbishop of Canterbury, spoke out just last week uh, about the Iraq war at a, at a memorial service at, for the end of the Iraq war in, in uh, uh, that's to say, the end of the Iraq war as far as the British are concerned. Uh, in Westminster Abbey just a week or two ago, and uh, he was castigated by the, the popular newspapers for being disloyal. And I think that brings in the final dimension about why it's sometimes difficult to speak about these things, because it sometimes seems difficult to speak against wars that are currently being conducted without seeming to undermine uh, our uh, sympathy and compassion and, and, and uh, encouragement of those who are serving in the armed forces. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of concern and compassion for those who have put their lives on the line for this country and its values. And even when it sometimes seems for many people that some of the values aren't being best pursued by pursuing one or two of these wars, it's very, very hard to say that with, with, without seeming to impinge on the lives of, the, uh, of those who've, who've, who've made great sacrifices. And, and I think the pastoral concern of the church sometimes inhibits its prophetic voice, but uh, that doesn't seem to me to be entirely a bad thing. Dean Wells, we have a question here from Twitter from Emerald 2000 and it is, he says, Matt here, can you say more about renewal when values themselves are questioned? Well, I guess that, I mean, the, uh, if I go back to the model I used at the very beginning uh, a, a few minutes ago in terms of when values are questioned, I think if values are deeply questioned, if, for example, we ask ourselves, is Wall Street, as it's currently constituted, a good way of leading uh, our nation's economy, uh, that would be, I guess, questioning a value, uh, then that's part of the first part of leadership, it seems to me, to say we have a real problem here and it affects many, many aspects of our common life. Um, uh, I don't think that means that there isn't a, uh, uh, that seems to me all the re more reason to be looking for renewal. Uh, once one said the practical steps one can take, then one's looking in that third area to say, well, uh, we, we actually need to go back to some core values of what it means to be America. And it seems to me to be the, uh, the free enterprise of the individual is a pretty significant uh, value in American history. Uh, and that appeared to be, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, encouraged by, for example, encouraging many, many people to take on mortgages that they clearly weren't in a position to fulfill. Uh, maybe we ought to go back to the core value and say, what, what does being a property-owning society, what does mean being a, a society that encourages individual entrepreneurs, does that require a little bit more regulation than perhaps it seemed a few years ago? Uh, that seems to be a, 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 good, a good time to ask those kinds of questions. Um, we all know how quickly uh, after a crisis we, we can forget the intensity of the questions we ask ourselves in a crisis. It seems to me to be that part of leadership is to, is to maintain the intensity of that kind of scrutiny, maybe longer than many of us would choose to. Dean Wells, we have about 200 people participating in this Office Hours session. Everyone is invited to jump into the conversation by Facebook by Twitter or by email. We've got an email question here that comes from Sarah on uh, another News of the Week, and she asks, what has been the Anglican Church reaction to the Pope's invitation to join the Catholic Church to more conservative Anglicans upset by the recent more liberal policies, particularly towards the ordination of women and open homosexuals? Well, this may not be something that all, all of you are, are, are particularly close to. Obviously, it pertains to me a good deal because I'm, a, I'm an Anglican, I'm an Episcopalian, uh, and so this is very much part of my world. What's happened is that the, uh, the Pope has, uh, has, has basically said that for those uh, Anglicans who uh, have perhaps for, for a long time wanted 
uh, to be within the Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church, but have wanted to maintain their own traditions, their own style of liturgy, uh, having particularly married clergy is obviously a, a hot button area. Um, there will be a possibility now for, for Anglicans to, to do that. And, and that's, you know, that, that's setting up a parallel structure to exists with, for example, Greek right Catholics, particularly in the Middle East, uh, who maintain a, you know, an Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox style of worship and, and their, their clergy live according to the Eastern Orthodox traditions, but they're actually part of the Roman Catholic Church. So it's, from the Pope's point of view, he, 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 I guess, feels that he's just setting up another parallel structure in addition to ones that he's got for other constituencies. I, I guess, uh, well, uh, what has been the Anglican reaction? It's been diverse, as reaction almost always is. There is a constituency within the Anglican Church that has always longed for this, that uh, particularly in England regards the Church of England as the continuing Catholic Church in England after the Reformation, uh, and would be very, very happy about this, this development. Possibly some might say it's, it's all what, what they've always wanted for perhaps the last couple of hundred years. Uh, I think on the other extreme there would be real cynicism that says, uh, well, w we've got a problem here with, uh, with Catholic, uh, the Catholic policy on celibate clergy, uh, and that's making it very difficult to recruit and keep uh, clergy in the church, that the Anglican Church, ironically, is going through uh, a, a lot of heart searching because it's trying to be more honest than perhaps it has been in the past about the reality of homosexuality within the church, uh, and that in a sense it's, uh, it's being punished for that by a church that perhaps isn't, uh, one might say, facing up to the issue of homosexuality amongst the church and amongst the clergy quite as directly as, uh, as perhaps the Anglican Church is trying to do right now. Um, I, I think I would take the view that if we look at what the Catholic Church claims to be, it claims to be the church for not just for all Christians but for all people uh, across the whole world. And even though the denominations are, are nice to each other about our different understandings of our mission, I don't blame the, the Catholic Church for believing that because I think that's the heart of what it means to be a Roman Catholic. To the, I mean, the word Catholic means you know for everybody. Uh, and so from time to time, uh, if you like, the mask slips and, and, and the politeness of the conversation is halted for a few moments and uh, the rest of the worldwide Christianity discovers that, that, Catholic, that the Roman Catholic Church really does intend to be everybody's church and isn't quite so polite to the other denominations for a while. I'm not seriously troubled by that, uh, or, or, although I do have a bit of a wry smile. Uh, it, it's, 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 if you like, it's the, it's the Pope saying we're not just another denomination. We're, we're really, fundamentally, the only show in town. And since I, I, I always suspected he believed that, it doesn't come as a big surprise when he puts it uh, in words of one syllable. Dean Wells bringing things back to Duke Duke Chapel, which is, of course, both a university chapel and a Christian congregation. So it stands at an intersection of faith and knowledge. And in fact, you preached yet another sermon. You do a lot of preaching, on the Duke motto, Erudito et Religio. How do you navigate this intersection of knowledge and piety? Well, there's a, there's a curious irony in, in Duke University's motto, because uh, as many people know, the motto is Erudito et Religio. Fewer people know that that com comes as a kind of Latinization of a quotation from a hymn of Charles Wesley's where he talks uh, about uniting the two so long disjoined knowledge and vital piety. What Charles Wesley is actually referring to in terms of knowledge and vital piety is what we might call faith and works, or uh, in another a more popular frame of reference we might call practicing what you preach. It's actually getting what you think and say in harmony with what you actually do. Um, now, uh, it, avoiding hypocrisy, I suppose, to use another way of putting it. Now, uh, that actually is something it's hard to imagine anyone at the university being against. But when you translate that into Latin and you get a word eruditio, which seems to mean knowledge, and you get a word religio, which seems to mean uh, religion, then you can sometimes get an apparent tension between uh, something that seems to be objective and something that is often portrayed as being very subjective and personal, and, and these seem to be in, in a certain amount of tension. Uh, and, and while that tension is, a, is an understandable one, I don't think it's uh, an insuperable one, uh, it isn't actually <laughs> what Charles Wesley was writing about in the hymn that was translated into the motto. So there's a kind of a, a bit of an irony 
going on. I, I, I do think that uh, the motto still has a great deal to offer to the university uh, because I think we should very much be in the business of, uh, of uniting our deepest searchings into truth and, and, and knowledge into our, uh, our deepest convictions in the, in the way that we live our lives and the way we use that, that knowledge. And our current president has, has often spoken of uh, his theme of knowledge in the service of society, and I think that's a very appropriate way of, uh, of expressing the, the motto eruditio et religio. Everyone watching is invited to jump into this conversation and ask Dean Wells a question by Facebook, by Twitter, or by email. Dean Wells, con continuing with your leadership at Duke Chapel, one thing that the chapel has done is sponsored residential homes in a nearby neighborhood. What's your vision for these homes? Well, I guess uh, there can be an anxiety in a university that, um, that we, we become a citadel of knowledge and resources and particularly money. Uh, and so we can become very uh, concerned about our relationship with uh, the local neighborhood and particularly the West End, which is where the chapel has a close relationship uh, that can be an anxiety that, <coughs> that somehow we have all the knowledge and the resources and the money, and they, we never necessarily articulate and put faces to who they are, somehow are needy. Well, I felt that there was a problem with the way this kind of relationship is generally configured, uh, and uh, that, uh, that actually we needed to send out very clear messages from the chapel that we don't see it that way. We see uh, the people of the West End is having immense gifts, uh, immense experience and imme immense wisdom uh, that we at the chapel couldn't really fully be the church unless we were in, engaged with and listening to uh, and learning from people, the kinds of people with whom Jesus spent most of his time. Uh, and so the establishment of houses in, 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 in that part of Durham was really about saying we can't really be the church if we're not first of all spending our time with the people whom Jesus spent most of his time with, but uh, secondly, we can't really be the church if we get into this assumption that when there's something wrong, we automatically chair the meeting, we automatically provide the resources, uh, and we all automatically think of ourselves as people who've got all the answers. Uh, if there's something wrong in some of the poorer parts of Durham, it's really for people in the poorer parts of Durham to articulate what, <laughs> what that is and what help they need, and for those of us who are uh, fortunate in terms of our level of income and our educational uh, experience, for example, to be uh, humble and say, you know, we're going to wait to ask, uh, to be asked in which way we, c we can help. And it may be that just being present and enjoying the community for what's wonderful about the community is actually the most appropriate thing we can do. Uh, some of the students that are living in, 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 uh, in the West End as sponsored by the chapel are uh, particularly pursuing what a vocation might mean for their life. In other words, how to integrate their studies, their faith, uh, and their future. Uh, and it's been my conviction, I guess, because it's uh, arisen out of my own experience that the best way to find out uh, what your future is, is first of all to, to practice, to have a go. They're doing internships, working largely with nonprofits in Durham. Uh, so they have a go and they try and find out and to live in community with one another so people you come to know and come to know you trust you and can tell you the truth about yourself um, but but also to live in, in in poorer communities where you discover how much initiative it takes to live on a low income and you realize that there are some skills that maybe a Duke degree doesn't give you that are well worth learning. Dean Wells, we have just over 200 people participating in this office hours session. Everyone is invited in to jump in and ask a question by posting a comment on the Duke University Facebook page, tweeting with the tag Duke Live, or sending an email to live at duke.edu. Dean Wells, if we continue down the chapel's portfolio, Duke's religious life program is uh, housed in the chapel, and it has a mandate for facilitating relations among faiths on campus. Have you found a way to have interfaith discussions that are neither boring nor violent? Mm -hmm. Well, I guess one of the initiatives that I've, I've established uh, has been the uh, Faith Council, which has been running for about two and a half years now. What I inherited, w which is very common to many university campuses, we have 25 or so lively religious life campus ministries. 
Um, but of course, if, if one looks at them uh, 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 as a whole, one, you know, what one sees is there's maybe 18 different kinds of ways of being a Protestant, and there's maybe uh, a Muslim and a Jew and a Buddhist and a Hindu and so on, and, and there's kind of only one way to be all the other things. And that seemed to me not to reflect Duke's aspirations as not just a national but a global university. I felt if we were going to be living in a global world, we needed to have a, a global approach to religious diversity. And so the Faith Council uh, sits together two Muslims, one Jew, one Hindu, one Buddhist, uh, a mainline uh, Protestant and Evangelical Protestant, and, 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 and a, a general spread across the traditions. And I felt one of the most important things we needed to do as, as religious groups on campus was, as you've said, address the fact that the popular perception is that religions, when they're put together, are either irrelevant because they only talk about personal things or about the afterlife or something like this, um, or they're dangerous because they, you know, they become explosive and violent. Uh, and I felt it was important for us to show two things, really. One, that the best way to deepen our understanding of our own traditions and also uh, discover uh, things we didn't already know in other traditions was actually to sit down and uh, and study texts together. We actually, if you like, we read, if anyone's been in a, in a Bible study or something like that, where you read a passage of the scripture and you, you, you seek to learn from it, well, we try to read each other's texts with the same degree of seriousness with which we read our own. And we challenge each other very seriously. We had a meeting just earlier this week in which some sort of fairly blunt words were said about the nature of our use of uh, wealth and resources and how that differs in its perceptions across different traditions. So we have to show that, uh, that we're, we're learning and we have to show that actually we're enjoying it. That's the second thing, that actually uh, rather than, in a, if you like, either ignoring or resenting the presence of people of other traditions on the campus, we, we, we need to make a public statement, a genuine one, not just for, for PR purposes, but we actually have to mean it, uh, that actually we're thrilled to have each other here and we feel that, I feel, for example, that I'm a better Christian for the presence of my Muslim or Jewish brothers and sisters. Dean Wells, what about people with secular convictions? Are they a part of these conversations or is that not appropriate? I don't think it would necessarily be inappropriate, but the, I mean, it's described as a faith council. And so uh, the assumption is that, 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 that the first people we would look to be part of that conversation were people of historic faith traditions. I guess what we're seeking to do is to establish not just a way of different faiths talking to each other, but over time to, dis, to, to model ways in which people of profound disagreements of almost any kind can actually talk to, get to one another civilly and learn from each other despite their profound differences. And, and it's still a fairly new organization. You know, we've been running two and a half years. We've, we, we meet together, uh, you know, about once a month. So we've met together about 25 times now. Um, I think once we become a little bit more established, we might have a little bit more confidence about saying, well, here's a model that will work outside our diverse faith traditions. But actually, diverse <laughs> faith traditions are pretty diverse. Uh, and, and I think that's, uh, you know, that's, quite a, that's quite a bit to be doing as, as we are now. I, if there are significant uh, voices coming from the, the secular world, the entirely secular world, that want to be part of that conversation, well, uh, then I think that possibly is the, is the next stage on from where we are now. Everyone watching is invited to jump into this conversation by Facebook, by Twitter, or by email. We've got an email here that says, Dean Wells, recently immigration reform seemed to be a church priority, but with the apparent economic scarcity, it seems churches are changing focus toward health care reform. Is this a responsible change of focus, or is this a dodging the question? Peace in Christ, the Reverend Matt. I, I, I'm not aware that the churches have ceased to regard immigration issues as being central, but I think there is a, <laughs> there's a clearly a huge public debate going on about health care reform, which, uh, which affects uh, enormous aspects of public policy, but also uh, American identity as a, as a nation and the church's witness uh, as a prophetic voice. And it would seem to be very appropriate to spend a lot of energy uh, on that issue, particularly as uh, you know, many people involved in the debate are very anxious that the uh, the prog so-called progressive uh, uh, plans for reform have been misrepresented in some areas, and 
the talk of you know death panels and things like this is it has, has 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 emerged from blog sites or something and suddenly taken a disproportionate role in the debate when it when it's not really relevant. Uh, so I think it's very important that, that churches have lively debates, and I've certainly tried to encourage this uh, at the chapel and a number of different forums. We've talked about uh, health care issues, and of course, when when one gets into health care issues, one quite quickly gets, first of all, into the whole issue of health and whether it's fundamentally about caring or fundamentally about curing and the extent to which healing is central to the gospel message. But one also gets into questions of taxation and uh, and, and, and to what extent the state should have a, a, a huge uh, influence on people's lives and people care enormously about these issues. So it seems to me extremely appropriate that uh, that the churches have uh, got uh, weighed into the health care debate. I don't, I don't feel that that necessarily means the immigration questions are being neglected, but I think it's, uh, it's, it's important for the churches to, f to have a, an awareness of what our legislators are, are talking about, not because that's where the gospel lies, but because it's important in ministry to, to show people that you and, and, and obviously uh, God care about what they care about. That seems to me central to ministry. Dean Wells, if we turn to your personal passion for your role, you are, of course, a priest in the Church of England who has wound up at a major American university, and people often talk about a call to the priesthood. Did you have such a call, and does it include your time here at Duke? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I like the way you've, you put wound up at a, an American university. I mean, I, I often uh, repeat the line because it applies to my life. If you want to make God laugh, you tell him your plans. Uh, I would never have guessed. In fact, a week before uh, I was invited to come and look at this job, I, I said to a friend I'd never move to the United States. So, uh, so here I am. So it's foolish to say such things. Uh, I Yes, my call to the priesthood. Um, well, I, I guess in some ways it was quite a pragmatic call in the sense that around about the age of 19 or 20, I, I was working in a factory as a, as a part-time job. And uh, I, it was one of these things where you, you wake up at six in the morning, you go straight to work, uh, and then you pause for breakfast at eight o'clock in the morning. And I remember pausing for breakfast at eight o'clock in the morning. And I was very, very frustrated uh, and a little bit miserable. And I think I, I thought to myself, well, do I want to live my life at... Uh, at evenings and weekends with the money I've made, or do I want my work to be my life? And, and, and that was a, a significant moment for me. I remember it quite vividly, exactly where I was when I was having those thoughts. Uh, and of course, it was a no-brainer once I asked myself that question. I wanted my work and my life to be all blended uh, into, into one. Of course, at the age of 19, you don't think about what that means when you have children or something like that, because at 19, you don't think a lot about those things very often. Uh, but uh, that was that was a that, so in some ways that was quite a, a pragmatic uh, realization, and then I've had a number of similar realizations as as I've gone along. I, I guess a, a second realization was a recognition that I I felt uh, the real central issue in the gospel that spoke to me was the, was issues of wealth and poverty, and so for that reason I spent ten of my first fourteen years in ministry in in areas of uh, acute social deprivation. Uh, and I guess another moment of realization for me would have been the, the point at which I realized I had academic gifts. I certainly had uh, some ability to get books published and people to read them. And uh, to realize that rather than that being a hobby, I, I, I had to realize that that was a gift that God had given me and I should integrate it into my ministry. And I guess it was probably because of that realization that my name came to the attention of people who were looking for a new dean of Duke Chapel and, and some, somebody read one of my books and they, they liked it and they said we ought to have a look at this person. Uh, so, I, so it's been an, an evolving vocation and, uh, and I think that's the case for, for, for most people that they, that at the age that, you know, in their mid-40s like I am now, they're, they're often doing things that they wouldn't really ever have thought of when they were 19. But that's, uh, that, that seems to me to be a wonderful thing. Everyone watching is invited to jump into the conversation by Facebook, by Twitter, or by email. We've got an anonymous email question here, Dean Wells, that speaks to the role of example in leadership. And the, the email uh, applauds the West End Initiative, but then says, uh, what about your own personal living situation in a prominent neighborhood near campus? So that's a... 
uh, Tough personal leadership question. I, in terms of example, well, I talked about the epitome. I mean, they may be, the, uh, I, of course, the, 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 the email's a little bit coded. I guess uh, uh, if, if people aren't aware, no reason why people should. I live in a, in a large house just off East Campus, uh, which was renovated uh, over the last couple of years. Um, well, I guess uh, the story of that house is partly about my own story of coming to terms with, uh, with what, what one does with money. Uh, I guess uh, when I was 19, I felt there was only one thing you should do with money. I didn't actually have any money at that stage in my life. So it was easier to have this view, and that, that was just, just give it away. Uh, as I came to reflect uh, on this use of poverty through living in socially disadvantaged areas for long periods of time, uh, I came to see a range of different possibilities in terms of what was good to do with money. And so because I'm very well paid now, and because I have a very prominent social, social role, which is why I get asked questions like this, um, uh, uh, my wife and I, in discerning what was the best thing to do in terms of our, uh, our work at Duke and our uh, involvement with the city of Durham, was rather than to live in very humble circumstances, um, was to, uh, to buy a house and to renovate a house that was not only doing, making a statement about our relationship with the environment by having various green dimensions to the house, um, our investment in the city of Durham by living in downtown Durham, uh, but also having a house big enough uh, to uh, host events for large numbers of people, and we do that very frequently. And so I, I guess if, if one isn't in a position to, uh, to enjoy holy poverty, if you like, then what are the al other alternatives? And we decided that one of the best alternatives would be to, to, to own nothing which one couldn't share and so what we try to do is to be generous what we ha with what we have rather than necessarily give it all away and I guess we probably have uh, um, I, I wouldn't care to, care to guess but dozens if not um, three figures of people through the house in the course of an, an average month students uh, Durham community people uh, um, and, and, and wider people from the community and um, that's how we choose to exercise the stewardship of, our, of such money as we have. Dean Wells, we've got another question here by email. It comes from Stephen in Richmond, Virginia, and he asks, Dean Wells, you preached a sermon prior to your time at Duke, which presented four widely held views about sexuality, particularly homosexuality as it relates to current church polity issues. I wonder what advice you can offer to church leaders who find themselves pressed from multiple angles to lead local congregations through this complicated debate? Well, uh, the yes, I, I won't go in detail uh, into uh, uh, the sermon I preached uh, about sexuality a number of years ago, although it is available in the book that you cited at the beginning of the interview, Speaking the Truth, uh, which is published by Abingdon. So it's in, the, it's in the public domain and people can read it if they want to. Um, what does it mean? Well, I, I guess I've led five congregations now uh, and uh, in the course of my uh, career, uh, ministry, I, and I've faced this issue uh, in, a, in all of those congregations, as, uh, as I guess most clergy do. Um, and uh, I guess my approach to it is, is really to, to seek to build up strong relationships with two constituencies, those in the congregation who, who are gay or lesbian and uh, are um, living out that identity through, uh, uh, through sustained relationships with other people who are gay and lesbian like themselves, um, and to, 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 to gain deeper relationships with those for whom this is a, a really deal-breaking issue, and there are obviously many people for whom this seems to be a, a deal-breaking issue, um, whether that's because of their understanding of the way human beings are made and, uh, and should live, or whether that's their understanding of what it means to be faithful to, to their interpretation of the, the scriptures. And basically what I've done is I've, I've gone to the houses and sat down for a couple of hours with each of the people that I feel have been either personally involved because of their gay identity or uh, involved through the, their strength of their convictions, people who've made you know public uh, or made it very well known publicly that they you know they will leave the church if this couple will continue to come or whatever it might be, um, and 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 said to the to the gay and to the lesbian people, well, uh, how how 
how do you understand this issue being best handled? Is this something you want to be very public about, or, or really, do you feel your involvement with this church is, is about being involved in the life of the, the regular life of the church, going on mission trips and maybe reading a, a lesson in the, in the service and doing all the kind of things that regular people do in, in churches, or, or do you want to make yourself a, 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 an issue? And oh, I've always had the same answer to that question, which is I'm not here for me, I'm here to worship God and I'm here to build up uh, the body of Christ. and, and um, and so I've said, well, okay, that's that's great. I mean, that that's that's how I see it too. Uh, I see God sees you as a, as a disciple first of all, as a baptized disciple first of all, and issues of uh, of sexuality are obviously part of that, but they're not absolutely central to that. Uh, and then I've gone to the people for whom this seems to be a deal-breaking issue uh, uh, in the other direction and said, can can you just you know help me understand why? with uh, the situation of global poverty, with the situation of global warming, with the situation of, uh, of evangelizing, uh, 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 to use an old-fashioned word perhaps, uh, uh, or, or those who, who don't share the Christian faith in appropriate ways, uh, why this particular issue seems to be one that you feel should take up a huge amount of our church's time, I mean, in terms of a congregation. And, you know, I've, I've never actually found that after a series of those conversations where I've really tried to listen as hard as I could, uh, that the issue has presented itself as a particularly significant one. So in the case of that sermon, for example, I preached that sermon after Bishop Robinson was ordained a bishop in New Hampshire a few years ago and everyone was talking about it. Uh, and what I did is I, 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 I emailed about 25 people in the congregation earlier in the week and said, you know, this is clearly something that we need to talk together uh, about as a community are the things that you feel I should know before I preach about it on Sunday. And people told me the most amazing things, which I still vividly remember. And I tried to uh, incorporate and, and recognize in appropriate ways in the sermon. So they felt and they knew that they'd been listened to in what I was saying. Uh, and those seem, uh, I mean, for your friend who's, who sent in the, the email, those would be the kind of ways in which I would address the issue. Dean Wells, we're here at your office hours. Is there any other ground that we should cover or a uh, final exhortation about leadership that uh, you want to speak to here as we get ready to, to wrap up? Well, I guess, I, I mean, I, I, I possibly could have given a longer answer about the question about priesthood. I mean, it seems to me there is a... Uh, priests are often asked to be leaders. I'm one of those, one of those people, I suppose. But priests aren't, in a sense, inherently leaders. And I think there's something important to say about what a priest is. Uh, my understanding that what a priest fundamentally is is a, is a person that speaks to God on behalf of the people and speaks to the people on behalf of God. Uh, and and I think there's something about the way Christians think about uh, authority, which is of course related to but slightly different to leadership. Which, uh, which I think relates to that, that core understanding of, 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 of what a priest is actually doing. And, and, and for Christians, uh, something fundamentally happened in Christ uh, that has changed the whole future of, uh, of, of humanity and, and of existence. And, and so when Christians talk about leadership in, diff 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 in difficult times, it, there's always a retrospective dimension to that. There's always a sense that there was a definitive difficult time, uh, and, th and that was the cross and resurrection of Jesus, and it was resolved in resurrection. Uh, but there was, no, there was no doubt there was a cross, uh, but, but it was resolved in resurrection. And so, I in a sense, our difficult times will never approach how difficult a time that was. Uh, and so we always live as a people of resurrection as Christians, uh, who are aware that how difficult the time is, uh, our conversation with God and God's conversation with us uh, is always subsequent to the, de the definitive difficult time, which is fundamentally over. Dean Wells, thank you for holding these office hours. The conversation can continue. Post a comment on the Duke University Facebook page, tweet with the tag Duke Live, or email live at duke.edu. Next week on Duke's Ustream channel, look for a discussion Tuesday from Duke Law on setting the record straight, legal and strategic thoughts on the war on terrorism. To learn more about Duke, visit duke.edu.